Welcome to Yahoo Finance Presents. I'm Brian Chung, joined here by a very special guest. That's the World Bank President, David Malpass. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Good to be on. So I wanted to kick things off with a statistic from the World Bank, pretty eye-popping numbers, saying somewhere between 71 to 100 million uh, could fall back into extreme poverty as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic. Wondering to start things off quite broadly, how, how is the World Bank factoring into that picture and how are you responding? Yeah, this is very concerning. Incomes have gone down and especially in many of the poorest countries. So it pushes people into extreme poverty. They, they might have been earning some income under the pre-pandemic, uh, but they've lost that from the informal sector, for example. So the World Bank is doing a number of things. One is uh, social safety nets. So for those countries that have some way to distribute money to the poor, uh, we can add money to that. That might be through cash transfers. Uh, that the, For some even poor countries, there are digital mechanisms for transferring cash. That's the best way because it actually gets to women, to people that are left out or marginalized in the society. So we're looking for those. Uh, then there's non-cash transfers, which might be food programs, for example, or coupons, things to help the, the extreme poor. So that's direct, and there are a number of ways to do that directly. And then the other thing that needs to be done is rebuild the jobs uh, after the pandemic. To do that, we're trying to maintain, help countries maintain their core businesses, the things that are needed to just have cities function, for example, and that's complicated itself. And then uh, you need to allow capital to flow to new businesses that might be created after the pandemic. There'll be a different world. So people will begin to anticipate that and look for ways to engage. And we want to help with that as well. So, David, you touch on a number of different, uh, I guess, ways that the World Bank is getting involved there. But what's been interesting is that you can show the money to back these projects up, about $160 billion in financing spread out over 15 months. I believe the first group of that assistance has already reached 25 countries. Uh, give us an example of the types of projects that you're financing. You mentioned recently uh, just now the types of things that you're working on. Uh, give us a little bit of a perspective on the ground of what that looks like. The, the first phase, this was in April and May, was to very rapidly have uh, agreements with countries so that we could help them buy uh, things like personal protective equipment. That that was the desperate initial need. Uh, and and that, that we were able to get uh, over 100 countries with signed um, uh, processes that could supply uh, uh, basic health goods. We're expanding that, and it, it will be the, the, those funding will be available for vaccines, for therapeutics, and for basic medicines as those are needed uh, during the crisis. One of the problems is the capacity of the country to make best use. Some countries have been drawing on those funds uh, and using them effectively, and then at, they're, they're able to ask for more. Other countries are having trouble, you know, figuring out what which hospitals need which things and we can provide some technical assistance on that but the country really needs to lead that effort then as we go month by month uh, forward uh, there there are a range of things that we are of financing that we're providing one is for for companies for for companies uh, th they need working capital they need uh, trade finance because a lot of that got cut off in the crisis. So we're, we're participating in that and often can lead that effort. And then as we go month by month, countries need to be thinking about what improvements, what changes they can make in their system in order to allow businesses to, to restart. Uh, and uh, very importantly is human capital. Uh, so the, the, that means schools, some, in some countries, schools are reopening. In other countries, they're trying to do distance learning. What we know is that children fall backward if they're out of school, if they're not participating in the system at all. And so that's, that's a 
grave concern and a high priority uh, to look at the children because they're going to be the generation of the future. Um, the food issues are very important and problematic for, for some of the countries. It, luckily or fortunately, it's not a global uh, crisis on food as it was in 2009. Uh, so there are supplies available in general on a worldwide uh, basis, but getting them to the people that actually need the nutrition um, is, is a big uh, part of the task. So all of the different World Bank uh, arms are engaged in, uh, in, in pushing forward as quickly as possible with countries, uh, and that includes infrastructure, education, health, uh, the, the, uh, the climate and environmental issues are, are, are uh, fully, fully uh, engaged. Um, and I, I want to mention one other, uh, one other area. As, as you look at this pandemic, it's been this double hit of the advanced economy shrank, and then they they were able to take some steps to stabilize. Those steps didn't translate to the developing countries. Mm -hmm. So we get an inequality that is worse, uh, su substantially worse, I think, than the 2008 Great, Great Recession. Uh, and that's because the developing countries have been hit much harder than uh, the advanced economies. Granted, the advanced economies were what were really hammered, but worse in the developing countries in terms of extreme poverty and in terms of their recovery path is even slower than in the advanced economies. And when you talk about that difference there, I imagine by region, the infrastructure is also going to look different when you look at some of those components you just laid out, like education, like the availability of food, for example. But what's been interesting to me is when you look at the coronavirus cases, it seems like the BRICS countries minus China, Brazil, India, Russia, South Africa have been experiencing quite a large rise in the amount of cases. Um, that's spread out across the world uh, geographically. Are there certain regions of the world that the World Bank has kind of zoned in on specifically with regards to helping them get through uh, this period of time with some of these World Bank projects? We wanted the, our response to be really broad because we didn't know which countries would have outbreaks. Uh, and until everyone has uh, addressed the problem uh, somewhat simultaneously, then it leaves uh, a worldwide problem. So uh, it, as far as which country, you know, it, there seems to be a rotation of the outbreaks. So for example, Spain had a severe outbreak early in Madrid, and then a later outbreak that was more in Barcelona. In India, Delhi has maybe had less than some other cities, though even there uh, it's concerning. Um, so you're right that uh, India, uh, Brazil have been hit hard, but I, I read over the weekend Italy is, is uh, uh, suffering a, a second uh, set of outbreaks. So my sense is there's there's a is still a global phenomenon uh, that that uh, interferes with everyone's ability to recover. So we need to keep the attention on on having uh, supplies available for for all countries that that need it and are able to use it effectively. Uh, so let's shift gears to what the World Bank's also been doing on debt servicing relief. That's a big role with a lot of these. Uh, developing countries facing pressure to uh, whether or not they can meet their bills with other sovereign countries. So I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, you've been speaking with the G7 finance ministers in addition to your counterparts and neighbors across the street over at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, what's the update on the debt service suspension initiative? Uh, do you see things changing? Because as I understand, the World Bank has said so far the magnitude of existing debt relief, quote, may be insufficient. Give us the update on that. Well, the the insufficiency is that a huge amount of assistance is needed for the for the developing world and especially the poorest countries. So even if it were doubled, it would it would not be enough to uh, uh, to 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 fill the the gap. Um, so what we what we're trying to do is the best we can uh, in, in the pandemic situation. I want to give you a little history. If you look back ten years ago, there had been a major global initiative to wipe off the debt of many of the poorest countries, called the HIPIC initiative. It, after that, then there was a new some new forms of lending that expanded rapidly, and that's that's created the the debt overhang 
that we are that that was there. It was a problem even before the pandemic. So it's been made worse by the global slowdown. Those the two types of debt. There was much more private sector debt uh, that that in the form, for example, of euro bonds, but also of certain types of bank loans uh, that came in uh, after the previous debt crisis that was in two in uh, 2000, 2001, two and three. Um, and so that that kind of debt needs a different type of uh, of so the commercial creditors need to participate. So far, the G20 has asked them to participate uh, voluntarily. Uh, but as we look forward, I I think there needs to be there needs to be they need to be fuller a part of this uh, debt reduction process. And then China became a very big lender uh, in and from multiple parts of China, different agencies within China. Um, and so they need to fully participate. So that's been the challenge. We, uh, I, I and Kristalina Georgieva of the IMF uh, 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 urged this initiative in uh, in March and April, and the G20 endorsed and, and launched uh, with the Paris Club the initiative. But China is not part of the Paris Club, so we end up country by country trying to make sure that we broaden the the debt moratorium. Uh, we're advocating extending the moratorium through 2021. Uh, but then I think also we need to be talking about the reduction in the stock of debt. The, the reason for that, if you're in a very low interest rate environment, it doesn't help the countries very much to simply tack the payments on to the end of their debt uh, maturity because it still has a very high burden on the country. So given the low interest rate environment and the severity of the pandemic, I think we need to look very quickly for ways to actually reduce the stock of debt for the poorest countries, those under debt distress. Well, and you know, the debt stock question is a, is a challenging one, especially during these times, because obviously you want to make sure that you have manageable levels of debt. You're not inflating your debt too much, but you also might need to rely on that debt to support some of the fiscal support uh, that these countries around the world have had to offer in terms of keeping payrolls whole or making sure businesses don't default because of this very unusual circumstance that we find ourselves in. So when you're working with countries on debt relief, how are you advising them on whether or not to reduce or uh, maybe at least hold steady the debt stock if it means being able to support your 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 economy? That's been the trade-off that we've wanted to emphasize to the G20 and to the commercial creditors as well, that uh, that uh, if they take payment uh, from the poorest countries, that means less money in the country for food for children. You know, you can, uh, it, it really is that dramatic. Uh, and so we need to have uh, everyone who, uh, everyone participating in this. The World Bank does it by very strong net positive flows. So for the countries, we're putting in huge amounts of new money uh, that helps. But if that money just ends up being paid to other, to creditors, uh, that, undercuts the value of it. So we're trying to work together with the international community uh, to uh, make to allow more resources to be available to the to the countries themselves as they fight COVID, but also the education crisis. Um, and that means the need for a lot of resources, but also importantly, it means the need for new investment. To, let's say next year you were considering investing in, in a country that's currently in debt distress. You'd be very reluctant because those, those delayed payments for, to the, all these creditors kick in either next year or in 2022. And so it makes it hard for you as a new investor to invest in the countries. So I think we've got to get to a reduction in the stock of debt. That's That will be the most valuable freeing up of resources that we can do. Uh, so I want to shift gears. You mentioned China earlier. Politically speaking, there's been a lot of uh, flaring tensions between the United States and China. Um, and it's calmed down recently, but there was some chatter on Capitol Hill, even if briefly, about the idea of, of refusing to pay China on U.S. debt that they might hold. From your vantage point at the World Bank, especially with the escalation of tensions, do you worry about the weaponization of debt, um, maybe not just in the U.S., but around the world? Um, 
you, China over the years, you know, the, this has come up of will China, uh, 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 will the U.S. pay China on the debt that China holds? And I, I think that part of the system is very stable. If you look at the relationships on finance, they've been strong. So when you say weaponization of debt, I, I don't think that's the, 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 the best term. A better way to think about it, I think, uh, is to think of debt as leverage in a country, and especially in the poorer countries, the heavily indebted countries. Uh, and so one of the things we're trying to do right, right now in uh, July and August is make sure that the debt that central banks offer to other central banks is properly accounted for. If it has the character of debt, uh, then it should be counted as debt because Otherwise, what you end up with is multiple leverage on a country, on, on the developing country, uh, to have the central bank repay the other central bank, and that gives political leverage. An example of that, Mongolia has had a relationship with China through the central banks um, that is, which I think, more properly characterized as a debtor-creditor relationship. If that can be transparent, transparency is very important in this because then people can look at it and understand what's going on. Interest being paid from Mongolia to China on debt that's held by the by the central banks. Um, and so then people can think about the role of that in the relationship between the two countries. So you mentioned central bank actions, and I think it'd be interesting to also put into context the Federal Reserve's actions in providing U.S. dollar liquidity globally. But what's been interesting to see is the dynamic of the dollar itself. One impact of this crisis has been a weaker dollar. I believe the dollar index is about a 93 handle. If you're one of those emerging markets with a heavy reliance on exports and you're watching the buying power of the world's you know, largest reserve currency going down, what are the uh, effects of that? It, you know, in the past, dollar weakness has been OK for the developing countries. Some of them are exporters, and so they, they uh, can benefit from the higher dollar price of their exports. And, and some of them have some degree of fixed rate debt so as in dollars, so that as the dollar weakens, that benefits the repayment stream. Um, and so I, I, I think the bigger question is not so much about the dollar itself, but will new FDI flows, foreign direct investment flows, uh, restart to the developing world? That the, what's been happening so far, this inequality problem is gigantic because um, it's both within countries, but it's across borders, and it's particularly apparent the advanced economies are recovering earlier, and the stimulus measures are aimed at benefiting the, the people of those countries, and there just is is not a mechanism right now for it to benefit the 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 poorer countries. We need to find that. I I I think that we know what the mechanism needs to be, but it's not there yet, and that's the new investment by the the global savers into the poor countries recognizing that they have huge upside potential. All right. Well, that was World Bank President uh, David Malpass. Thank you so much for joining us here on Yahoo Finance today. Thanks, Brian.